What's up everybody? Tom McGurl here again for another night of live coding. We're gonna be doing something a little different tonight um, rather than kicking it off with you know some JavaScript or continuing the React Native app. We're gonna try learning Rustlang. What up Noah Berm, welcome to the chat. Yeah, so tonight we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna follow along with the book called The Rust Programming Language. Uh, the Rust stations or the Rust community call it the book. It is the go-to guide here for things. What up, Archangel25? Let's go, Rust. Woo! Yes, I'm excited. Um, I haven't done Rust before. I've I've touched a little bit. I've you know started a little bit of the tutorial. I've done you know, the basic Hello World, but we'll be starting over from scratch here today. We're gonna kick it off with the book. We're gonna continue going chapter by chapter and just kind of learn Rust together. Um, if you joined us in some of the past streams, we built the React Native app. You can find that on my GitHub. Uh, you can find that on YouTube. It's Tom McGurl. Uh, we also did building a serverless API with AWS Lambda, DynamoDB, and TypeScript. Also available on YouTube. But now we're going to go into Rust. You know, I've, I've heard good things. I'm excited. Uh, so let's jump in. I posted a link in the chat to the book we're going to be following. Again, it's the Rust programming language. So a special thanks to the authors uh, of the book, uh, Steve. Klobnik and Carol Nichols with contributions from the Rust community. So check it out. It's the go-to spot. We're going to pull it up here right now. Woo, pause in the chat. Let's go. It's going to be hype. I know. It's, we're just going to be reading a book. We're going to be reading a book and coding, but we're going to keep it hype. All right, let's go. So whew, here we go. We got the Rust language book. Um, now, I might have to ask you in the chat because we have a few different options for how we're going to read this. We can do, we got light which is default, which I, I, I'm not feeling that one. You know what I'm saying? We got Rust, you know? So Rust for Rust. Coal, which is also a little bland. Might be better for the stream though. You, you let me know in the chat. Navy, we can go through it. Navy, Navy kind of gels with my code, you know, my syntax highlighter I got in VS Code. IU or AYU, AU. This one's cool too. So what do you think in the chat? We're going to go with AU, Navy, Cole, or Rust. If no one picks, we're just going to go with Rust. We're going to stick with the OG. We're definitely not doing light. <laughs> How am I going to see? AU. All right. No. Oh, Cole greater than AU greater than Navy greater than Rust. Really? Cole, Cole is my least favorite. Wow. All right. We're going to go AU then. Navy looks the best, but AU is most readable. All right. Let's go with AU because we want to go with readable here. Little contrast. Is that why we're going with the contrast? Thank you, Sagun esque Appreciate it. Let's go. All right. So the Rust programming language. This is kind of a little forward to tell you about the version. Uh, we're going to be using the edition 2018. Um, so feel free to read this. We'll just go through it quickly. It just is kind of explaining some of the things that have changed. Um, but really importantly, what I want to point out is uh, the authors here. So Steve Klobnik and Carol Nichols. Thank you for your contributions. This book is awesome. I've heard amazing things. Everyone's told me to go here first, and this is where we should learn, so we're diving in. Hey, you, how you guys doing? What up, part-time lover? Yeah, let's go. All right, so we got the forward. So why are we here? Let's find out. Why are we learning Rust? We've heard cool things. What are we going to do with it? Let's see. If it wasn't clear, the Rust programming language is fundamentally about empowerment. I'm liking that. Rust empowers you to reach further, program with confidence in a wider variety of domains than you did before. That sounds exciting. And I'm not going to read it word for word. I'm going to kind of skim it. So feel free to read on your end, but I'm going to skim it. We'll skim it together, right? Take, for example, systems level work that deals with low level details of memory management, data representation, and concurrency. This is key. So I'm going to read this part. Traditionally, this realm of programming is seen as arcane, accessible only to a select few who have devoted the necessary years learning to avoid its infamous pitfalls. And even those who practice it do so with caution lest their code be open to exploits, crashes, or corruption. All right, a little bit of, we're going with a little bit of, uh, you know. Oh, thanks, Archangel. All right. Rust breaks down these barriers by eliminating the old pitfalls and providing a friendly, polished set of tools to help you along the way. Programmers who do need to dip down into lower level control can do so with Rust. That's what, that's what we're going to see. We're going to mess around with it. Let's see. Programmers already working with low-level code can use Rust to raise their ambitions. Introducing parallelism in Rust is a relatively low-risk operation. That's awesome. If you've been here with us doing JavaScript, we know that parallelization would be amazing. We don't have it, right? But uh, 
Oh, hold on to your butts. Yeah, it's going to get crazy, Clam. Uh, Rust isn't limited to low-level systems programming, though. It's expressive and ergonomic enough to make CLI apps, web servers, and many other kinds of code quite pleasant to write. So that's what we're here for, right? We're trying to learn all the different ways we can use it, see what we can build. So this book fully embraces the potential of Rust to empower its users. It's a friendly and approachable text intended to help you level up not just your knowledge of Rust, but also your reach and confidence as a programmer in general. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do this here together. All right? So dive in. Get ready to learn. Welcome to the Rust community. Woo! Forward by Nicholas Matsakis and Aaron Turan. Thank you for that. All right. Here we go. Introduction. Let's figure it out. Let's figure out together. What is it for? Ready? Welcome to the Rust program language. Woo! We're here. Who is Rust for? Rust is ideal for many people for a variety of reasons. Let's look at a few of the most important groups. All right. Teams of developers. That's us on the chat. We're a team, right? We're a team, you know, but we're talking about providing to be a productive tool for collaborating among larger teams of developers. So very cool with varying levels of systems programming knowledge. So we in the chat, we're all going to have variable, variable, uh, variable levels of systems programming knowledge, right? I haven't done much of it. I did a little C in school, but since then I haven't touched it, right? So that'll be cool. Uh, let's see. In Rust, the compiler plays a gatekeeper role by refusing to compile code with these elusive bugs, including concurrency bugs. So we're talking about bugs that are you know hard to get. In JavaScript, it's going to let us do anything, right? That's why we used TypeScript for the last thing. We wanted a little bit of that, you know, that feel. We wanted to check out TypeScript and get a little bit of that safety. But JavaScript was letting us play loose, you know. Woo! What up? We got a few more. Thanks, Noah, for giving everyone the welcome. I appreciate that. All right. So Rust also brings. Con contemporary developer tools to the systems programming world. This is something it's been lacking, right? If you've dealt with C, you've dealt with this. Cargo, which we're going to check out in just a bit. It's the included dependency manager and build tool. It makes adding, compiling, and managing dependencies painless and consistent across the Rust ecosystem. Rust FMT, which I haven't messed with yet, ensures a consistent coding style across... Oh, it's Rust format. So yeah, so if you're using the Rust extension VS Code, which we'll dive into a bit, we can just get this hooked up and it'll format your code for you. The Rust language server... Powers integrated development environment, IDE, integration for code completion and inline error messages. Sweet. It's also good for students. If any of you are students, Rust is for students and those interested in learning about system concepts. So in, in school, we had an operating systems class. Check out Rust. Companies. Hundreds of companies, large and small, use Rust in production for a variety of tasks. Yep, there's a bunch listed. Uh, I just purchased the Rust in Action book. It's a different book than this, but it lists some of the major companies using it and what they're using it for. So really cool. You got AWS using it. You have Azure, so Microsoft, Amazon, big companies. Google's even using it. Open source developers. Rust is for people who want to build the Rust programming language. Community, developer tools, and libraries. So contribute. Maybe we will. We'll check out the issues, see if there's anything we can dump into. People who value speed and stability. This is kind of why I'm here, not gonna lie. I'm excited to see, I've heard uh, Rust is very quick, can let you do the systems programming in a very quick kind of safe way. Um, if you've dealt with type languages, that's why I'm pretty excited for this. But Rust is for people who crave speed and stability in language. By speed, we mean the speed of the programmers, programs that you can create with Rust and the speed at which Rust lets you write them. The Rust compiler checks ensure stability through feature additions and refactoring. Something similar to when we use TypeScript, right? Or if, if you've uh, you know followed me before on Twitter, you know that I used Elm for a while. So something like that. Rust language hopes to support many other users as well. Those mentioned here are merely some of the biggest stakeholders. So if you don't fall into any of these groups, which you all do, right? Because we always we're all always students, right? Even though if we're not in in school, we're always learning. We're always students. We are a technically a team of developers, or you know, if you're here and you're learning, you're developing, right? So we're not a company. We might be one day, not yet. All right. So how to use this book. So this is what we're going to do here. We're going to use it together. We're going to use it. There's, there's a guide here about how to progress through the chapters. We're going to kind of go straight through. Um, so if you are familiar with programming, great. It'll be kind of a review in some of the chapters. If you aren't as familiar with programming, It'll be great because we're going to go through some of the basic stuff. So some of the sections, which you'll see here, some of the chapters cover concepts that are similar in other languages, but we're just going to kind of flow right through chapter by chapter. We're going to try not to skip anything for the benefit of everybody. And it's always good to kind of reiterate some of the things we've learned over the years. So we'll dive into that. So this is going to get, kind of give us an overview of what we're getting into. So we're going to go through chapter one. That's going to explain how to install Rust. 
right? We're going to get cargo going. We're going to get Rust. Um, chapter two, hands-on introduction to the Rust language. That'll be really fun. We'll start coding, right? Uh, get our hands dirty right away. Uh, chapter three is going to cover features similar to those in other programming languages. So if you're coming from JavaScript, Python, Java, C, whatever, right? Um, it's going to kind of compare some of the concepts we've seen in the language to Rust. So that'll be pretty cool. I'm excited about that. Chapter four to learn about Rust's ownership system. That's one of the really cool things I've heard about Rust. It has a cool ownership system. It's kind of without it being a garbage compiled language, there's a way to share um, variables and memory across. And the ownership is going to kind of be a cool way to see how things are borrowed and shadowed. Excited for that. All right. And then it says, however, you're a particularly meticulous learner who prefers to learn every detail before moving on to the next, you might want to skip chapter two and go straight to chapter three. Um, we're not going to do that. We're going to go in order. What up, Pacao? Welcome. And yes, Archangel, back to the basics for sure. All right. We'll get into those chapters later. We'll just kind of jump in. So let's check this out. Everyone loves the crab, right? The rust station. Cool little mascot of rust. Uh, so it's got some little things here for us to keep out out you know keep an eye for so if we see uh ferris is with a question mark the code doesn't compile if we see it like that right the code panics this code block contains unsafe code it's like a and then uh this code does not produce the desired behavior it's kind of like a you know all right so let's jump in uh here you see a note the source files from which this book are generated can be found on github awesome also, fun fact, this book is downloaded with every installation of Rust. So you can open this book once you've installed Rust. So it's pretty cool. Uh, you can download it. It's, it's all free. It's great. We're here. Best documentation ever. Yeah, I'm excited. We're here. Ready? Getting started. Let's start a Rust journey. Come on. Lots to learn, but every journey starts somewhere. And in this chapter, we'll discuss installing Rust on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. We are on Mac OS. If you're on anything else, you'll see the instructions here. We're going to write a program that prints Hello World, or maybe we'll use Cargo to cheat to get a program to get Hello World, although I think that's the third thing, using Cargo, Rust Package Manager, and Build System. Let's jump in. All right. Installation. It all begins here, right? First step is to install Rust. We'll download Rust through Rust Up, command line tool for managing Rust versions and associated tools. You'll need an internet connection for the download. Well, we have that, right? You're all on Twitch. You're here. Well, you have that. Right. All right. So use that internet connection to follow. I'm just kidding. Use it to uh, to download the thing here. Note: If you prefer not to use Rust Up for some reason, please see the Rust installation page. We're going to use Rust Up. Easy. All right. This is just kind of giving you an outline of what command line notation looks like. You could see we have this here for our Mac OS terminal here. Um, so let's jump in. I'm on Mac OS, so it's going to be similar to Linux setup. And so we're going to install Rust Up using curl. So we're just going to go ahead and copy this. I'm going to toss this over here. We got my editor over here and let's run this command to install. If you're on Windows, also there's a nice little copy thing here. If you're on Windows, you can just find down here. It's just a, it's a little slightly different installer. It's going to link you to the website to install. Feel free to do that. Or if you're using PowerShell, right, you could probably just use this. So let's go ahead and curl this thing here. I got to get rid of that dollar sign there. All right, so it's asked me a few questions. Cargo, Rust, Rust up, and other commands will be added to Cargo's bin directory. All right, so let's say we're going to proceed with installation. So we're getting all these things. We're getting Cargo, which we'll see what that does. Clippy, the Rust docs, ooh. Rust analysis, Rust source, and RLS. So let this install. While this is installing, let's read a little bit further. Okay, so download a script and starts the installation of Rust up tool, which installs the latest stable version of Rust. You might be prompted for your password. If the install is successful, the following line will appear. And we see the following line. Uh, and here it says, to get started, you need Cargo's bin directory in your path. Environment variable, next time you log in, this will be done automatically. To configure current shell run source. So we'll just run that to go ahead and put it in there. All right. Now, let's skip the Rust Up and Windows. Updating and uninstalling. After you've installed Rust via Rust Up, updating the latest version is easy. From your shell, run the following update script. So we probably have it, right? Because we just installed it. But to be better safe than sorry, 
messed up update don't cheat all right so uh there we go single channel updates checking for self updates stable we got it we're good uh to uninstall rust which we're not going to do right if we got this far and we uninstalled it and i just shut off come on that's not what we're doing here let's let's move on all right i'm gonna see what version i have you all can do the same we're just gonna do rust c dash dash version so i'm on 1.46 best version come on it's the best version right um all right, so that's our little semantic versioning information. You can read more about semantic versioning online, Google Semver. Um, there's also, it says here we can go to the beginner's channel on the official Rust Discord. Maybe we'll do that. That'd be cool. All right, this is what I was talking about. The installation of Rust also includes a copy of the documentation locally, so you can read it offline. Let's check that out. I'm just going to clear my terminal here and run Rust up doc. Check it out. Very cool. Pretty cool. Look, it has a link right here to the book. That's awesome. And look, it's running right off my file system. Like I said, it's installed it with Rust. That's pretty awesome. So you don't need to be online to check this stuff out. Great. All right. Hello world. Woo. This is the one of the biggest programs we're ever gonna write. You know? Hello world, just classic example. All right, now that we've installed Rust, let's write our first program, please. It's traditional when learning a new language to write hello world. I'm sure if any of you have learned any languages, you've done this. Cool. We're going to try it out. OK. You can see here, it's got a little note that the book assumes a basic familiarity with the command line. Um, if anyone is having trouble with the command line or any of the, the things as we follow along, feel free to message in the chat. If I can't answer, I'm sure uh, people in the chat would be happy to answer, but I can also do my best to answer any questions. Um, so feel free to ask, but we're going to go ahead and just continue as if we are all familiar with this, but no worries if you're not. All right, creating a project directory. We'll start by making a directory to store our Rust code. It doesn't matter to Rust where your code lives. Um, so we'll make, we'll make a directory. So what I'm going to do is I'm in my uh, developer here. I'm going to make a new directory because I'll be putting all this code up on GitHub. So let's do, we'll call it learn rust live all right we're going to jump into learn rust live and we're going to go ahead and make well let's create a projects folder in here because then we'll have our projects so i'm just going to do make dir projects all right we're going to jump into projects and we're going to make a directory called hello world to hold our hello world project all right and let's go ahead and cd into there all right, so we are inside our hello world folder. Here's the command for Windows for those of you on Windows. And let's open up our editor. I'm gonna go up a level here, up one more level, and I'm gonna open up VS Code. And I'll just pop VS Code over here. Okay. So let's make a new source file and call it main.rs. All right. Let's go into our projects. We have our hello world. So it, VS Code's just showing me that I'm already in hello world. And I'm going to create a new file called main.rs. Uh, Rust file always end with the .rs, .rs extension. If you're using more than one word in your file name, use an underscore to separate them. So something similar to, that you'd see in Python with the underscore, I believe we call that snake case. Um, for example, you use hello world.rs rather than hello world rs. So now open the main rs file you just created, enter the code list in listing one one. So let's go ahead and enter that code. Um, also, just a heads up, if you're using VS Code, you probably want to install the Rust extension. It's going to have better syntax highlighting as well as uh, probably some other features, maybe Rust format we might be able to get working, but uh, for now, I think it's important to just say so you have the syntax highlighting so things will look like in your editor what they look like in here. If you're using Vim, you'll obviously have to install something different. If you're using, I don't know, Atom, maybe Sublime Text, maybe you're using something crazier. I don't know. But VS Code is what I'm using, so I've already installed that. All right, so let's go ahead and code out this main function. Um, also, you're going to see here, you know, I'm used to JavaScript, so I have two spaces as my tab. Uh, but in Rust, we're going to use four. So I'm going to go ahead and just change my spaces to spaces four. There we go. And I'm going to print ln 
it had a nice autocomplete. That's another benefit of having the extension Archangel. Absolutely. Happy to help. And here we go. Hello world. Let's save that. What is it? It's a program. Look, I love this. Listing 1-1, a program that prints Hello World. This is almost more text here than the actual thing here. All right, so we're going to save the file and go back to our terminal window on Linux or Mac, enter the following commands to compile and run the file. Now, um, I'm just going to open up my terminal here below so we can have the code above and the terminal below. Feel free to do it you know, the same or do it in your you know, terminal, whatever you want. So we're going to run Rust C, which I believe is Rust compile, and we're going to compile let me just go into my projects hello world rust c main.rs all right so now we have this main executable so i'm just going to do dot slash main and there's hello world so let's see if it's going to break down what happened in that little step here's the command in windows for those of you on windows convention is there a reason for using four spaces? Yes, so I think you'll see it in a little bit. They will explain that. Um, but yeah, generally each language has its own conventions or a styling guide. And so for Rust, they've decided that four spaces is the way to do it. Python, you'll, you'll see common indentation is four. Um, that's how Python is based. But the, the reason that Rust is settled on four spaces was it looked good. And then they decided to put that into the Rust format. So Rust format is going to be the standard way to format your code. And that will do the four spaces for you. So if you're not writing it in four spaces, that's fine. You can just install Rust format, run that on your code, and it'll format to be four spaces. And I think they'll get into that in a little bit. Again, the reason I know it is because I had already read some of this um, and some of the other Rust books. So I have a little familiarity. But I, I do remember them specifically talking about it. Can you name the function something else other than main? I don't know yet. Um, I'm assuming no. Um, and the reason I'm assuming that is in Python, I'm assuming it's similar to Python, where Python programs start from your main. I know that you can have other functions uh, other than main, but I don't know. We'll find out together. Good question, though. All right, let's see. Um, Regardless of the operating system, the string hello world should print in the terminal. And it did. We can see right here. If you don't see this output, refer back to the troubleshooting part of the installation section for ways to get help. So if you didn't see this, check out the troubleshooting section. I can post the link in the chat. There. All right, anatomy of Rust program. All right, so I think we're going to find out right now. Oh, so you can see here the main function is special. So here we go. Uh, let's read the detail of what just happened in our hello world program. Here's the first piece of the puzzle. So the function main. Uh, these lines define a function in Rust. The main function is special. It is always the first code that runs in every executable Rust program. The first line declares a function named main that has no parameters and returns nothing. So it's a void function. If there were parameters, they would go inside the parentheses. Right there. Also note that the function body is wrapped in curly braces. So this is similar to something we see in JavaScript, right? What's the benefit of building the file before executing it? Um, because the unfortunately, until you have the executable, uh, the Rust file can't be executed. So the way that Rust is working, and this is to answer Noah's question in the chat, uh, the way that Rust is going to work is it's going to take your .rs file, which is a Rust program, and compile it. So it's going to run it through the compiler, which would tell us if we had errors or issues. And it's going to create a binary file that could be run on both Mac and Windows. So I could share this main file, and it will run on any operating system. So that's the benefit of it being a compiled to binary language. So uh, that's why we first build the file or compile it before we can execute it. We can't execute the .rs um, as it doesn't know what it is. It's telling me permission to die, but it doesn't know what it is. Whereas this main file is a binary that can be run anywhere. Um, and it is useful. Yeah, we could run this on a server. Oh, what up, Pepo Voila. Thanks for the follow, man. Or woman, whoever. Thanks, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And let's continue. Uh, like a little doc. Exactly. So you could run it on genders. Yeah, right. Um, welcome to all. Uh, like you could run it on you know, an operating system. You could run it on a machine. I'm sure people can figure out ways to run Rust embedded on something like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so that's the benefit of compiling to binary, plus the benefits of the compiler. Right? It can tell us errors and things like that. All right. Now, let's see. What are we putting inside this main? Oh, first, before we get into that. So we talked about the curlies. That's something we see in uh, JavaScript. So we're very familiar with curlies if you followed along. If not, that's how we create little blocks of code. 
Rust requires these around all function bodies. It's a good style to place the opening curly bracket on the same line as the function declaration, adding one space in between. And you can see that right here, that little space. At the time of this writing, an automatic formatter called Rust Format is under development. If you want to stick to a standard style across Rust projects, Rust Format will format your code in a particular style. Very cool. Uh, the Rust team plans to eventually include this tool with the standard Rust distribution. Very cool. That'd be awesome. So depending on when you read this book, it might already be installed on your computer. Let's see if it's already installed. <gasps> it is. So let's run it on main.rs. It's not going to do anything because it's already formatted correctly. So let's try this. I'm going to save that. Let's run Rust format. Bam. Check it out. It put the four spaces. So if you're not writing with four spaces, don't fret. You can use Rust format and format your code. So use whatever looks visually, you know, visually okay to you. Just know that when you view other people's Rust code, they're going to be using four spaces. So getting used to looking at it that way is probably beneficial. All right. Inside the main function is the following code: print hello world. Well, this sounds pretty, you know, you kind of understand what's going on here, right? This line does all the work in this little program. It prints text to the screen. There are four important details to notice here. First, Rust style. Here we go. Rust style is to indent with four spaces, not a tab. Second. Print ln calls a Rust macro. See this exclamation point? If it called a function instead, it would be entered as print ln without the exclamation point. We'll discuss Rust macros in more detail in chapter 19. For now, you just need to know that using an exclamation point means we're calling a macro. So we don't have macros in JavaScript, so we've never used this, this pattern of using exclamation point. If you've used other languages with macros, maybe Ruby, uh, Elixir, um, then you've done some code with macros. It basically is a nice way to write functionality into a, another function that can run. Uh, and it says they'll get more into it. So we will do that when they get into it. Third, you see hello world. This is a string. If you've programmed with us before, you know a string is some text, right? We'll pass the string as an argument to print ln, the macro. And the string is printed to the screen. Fourth, we end the line with the semicolon, which indicates that this expression is over and the next one is ready to begin. Most lines of Rust code end with semicolon. I did not do that. And interestingly enough, Rust format didn't add it. But we'll put it there. OK, compiling and running are separate steps. So Noah, I think this will get into your question that you asked. Um, you've just run a newly created program, so let's examine each step in the process. Uh, before running the program, you must compile it using the Rust compiler by entering the Rust C command and passing the name of your source file like this. So Rust compiler, main.rs, that's our source file. Um, if you have a C or C++ background, I don't, I don't know if any of you do, uh, you'll notice that this is similar to GCC or C Lang. After compiling successfully, Rust outputs a binary executable. If you've used Java before, you've also probably used a compiler. On Linux, macOS, and PowerShell on Windows, you can see the executable by entering the ls command in your shell. Our Linux and macOS, you'll see two files. And we did that here. You can see we have our main and our main RS. Uh, this shows a source code file. That's the one with the RS extension. The executable file, which you'll have a .exe uh, at the end if you're on Windows, but on Mac, we'll just see it as plain main, right? And we saw that. Um, if main RS was your Hello World program, this line would print Hello World in your terminal, and it does. So again, we can run .main, and there's our Hello World. Just compiling with Rust C is fine for simple programs, but as your project grows, you'll want to manage all the options and make it easy to share your code. Next, we'll introduce you to Cargo tool, so the cargo tool will help us write real world Rust programs. Very cool. I also want to touch upon this part here because this is extremely important. If you're familiar with a dynamic language such as Ruby, Python, or JavaScript, if you followed along here, you've definitely done some JavaScript, uh, you might not be used to compiling and running a program as separate steps. So Noah, this is going to touch on your question. Rust is an ahead of time compiled language. What that means is it's compiled ahead of time, aka before we run the code. If you've, ran, if you've ran JavaScript before, your browser will request a JavaScript file. And at the time it gets the file, it'll compile it and run it, right? So you won't know if you've shipped errors to your code. Hopefully you've tested it, right? But you won't actually know if at runtime it's going to run into errors. Whereas a ahead of time compiled language can do some static analysis prior to the code being run, um, especially a language like Rust that's going to have types. And it can do some inference and see when it compiles your code, if it compiles correctly. And it can also do some checking for basic uh, failures or errors, such as not handling an error case that could happen and things like that. So it's a combination of being compiled and typed language that give us those benefits. 
Um, so it's an ahead of time compiled language, meaning you can compile your program and give the executable to someone else and they can run it even without having Rust installed. That's pretty cool, right? If you give someone a, a Ruby file, a Python file or a JavaScript file, they need to have Ruby, Python or JavaScript implementation installed. And believe me, if any of you have used Mac OS, you know that you have one version of Python installed. It's like 2.7, whatever. And then everyone else is using Python 3. So you're either going to pull out virtual M or you're going to install a secondary Python using pip. Don't have to deal with that. If I give you a binary, you can just run it. So very cool, right? Uh, but in those language, you only need one command to compile your program. Everything is a trade-off in language design. This is true. All right, so let's check out this cargo thing. It sounds pretty cool. Hello, cargo. Cargo is Rust's build system and package manager. Most Rustations, which, yo, I don't know if we're Rustations yet, but we're getting there, right? Let's go. So most Rustations use this tool to manage their Rust projects because Cargo handles a lot of tasks for you, such as building your code, downloading the libraries your code depends on, and building those libraries. So it sounds like something like maybe NPM or Create React app, right? Or maybe um, Mix if you are if you used Elixir. Um, the simplest Rust programs, like the one we've written so far, don't have any dependencies. So we don't really need this. So we just built Hello World project with Cargo. It would only use part of Cargo that handles your building of the code. So we wouldn't really be taking full advantage of it. As you write more complex Rust programs, you'll add dependencies. And if you start a project using Cargo, adding dependencies will be much easier to do. Cool. Because the vast majority of Rust projects uses Cargo, the rest of this book assumes that you're using Cargo too. So we're going to use Cargo. I'm excited. It comes installed with Rust if you use the official installer, which we did. Um, if you installed Rust through some other means, check whether Cargo is installed by entering the following in your terminal. So we know it's installed because we used uh, the correct installer there, but we could just check the version. And it's the same as our Rust version, 1.46. So seems like they keep those uh, in line. At least they are here. So pretty cool. Creating a project with Cargo. Let's create a new project using Cargo and look at how it differs from our original Hello World project. Navigate back to your project's directory or wherever you decided to start your code. Then on an operating system, run the following. So we're going to create a new program. So we're going to step back into our projects folder and we're going to run Cargo new Hello Cargo. And let's jump in there. And here we have, I'm going to open up my file thing here. Oh, sorry. And here's our Hello Cargo. Oh, and we can already see there's a lot of stuff here. Well, at least more stuff than there was here. We have a source folder, a git ignore. So it's assuming we're using git. And if any of you have used git, if you've followed along to any of the videos, we've been using it. Uh, this is what's going to be ignored from source control. Um, and I'm sure they're going to go into that. So let's dive in. The first command creates a new directory called Hello Cargo. Uh, we've named our project Hello Cargo. And it creates its files in the directory of the same name. Go to the Hello Cargo directory and list the files. You'll see it has generated two files and one directory for us. A Cargo TOML file and a source directory with the main RS file inside. It is also initialized new Git repository with the Git ignore file. Git files won't be generated if you run Cargo new within an existing Git repository. We didn't run it in an existing repository, ran it in a new repository, so created it. You can override this behavior by using Cargo new VCS equals Git. It is a common version control system. I'm not going to go over that. We've used it. Um, let's open up this cargo toml, right? Cargo.toml. Ooh. There's my name. There's my email. Feel free to send me inquiries, emails, whatever. That's fine. It's here. It's public. You can see it now. No big deal. Um, toml. What is a toml? <gasps> Yo, they named it after us. It's Tom's obvious minimal language. Let's see. What is this? What is this? Oh, thank you, Rust. I appreciate you. I appreciate this. They named this after me. Uh, Tom's obvious minimal language. Ignore this. I don't think, I think it's probably not, it's probably about, it's probably named after me, right? Um, uh, no, but it's by Tom Preston Werner, Pradyan Gedam, and everyone else. So this is kind of cool. So if you've used YAML, or you've used JSON, or you've, if you've used XML, or something like that. Um, it's another kind of file. So if you use YAML or JSON, it's probably similar to something like that. So YAML, indent-based, right? JSON, you have your curly brackets. Uh, this is a cool version. It looks pretty cool. I think the name Tom's Obvious Minimal Language kind of says what it's going for. 
uh, minimal configuration file format that's easy to read due to obvious semantics. <gasps> Designed to map unambiguously to a hash table. Toml should be easy to parse into data structures in a wide variety of languages. So cool choice, interesting choice. I think, uh, does YAML stand for YAMS atrocious middle language? I think it does. Yes, yes, it does. Um, but yeah, this is pretty cool. I think it's pretty clear, like all this stuff goes under package dependencies. It is an interesting choice though. I think they definitely made a choice here you know, most languages would kind of be like, what's what's the main thing? Let's go with JSON. Let's go with a YAML file. If any of you, if you, if you remember the last video, we used the serverless framework, right? The serverless framework by default used YAML, uh, but in the TypeScript version, it used TypeScript. So um, this is definitely a choice. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. I think they were like, hey, we can make a choice here. We can not go with something that's extremely common. We can go with potentially what they think is the best. I like it. It's named, at, it's named after me, you know, so very cool. Let's see what it does though. Enough blabbing. Okay. What does it do? The first line package is a section heading that indicates the following statements are configuring a package. As we add more information to this file, we'll add other sections and we could see another section dependencies here. The next four lines set the configure inf configuration information cargo needs to compile your program, the name, the version, who wrote it and the addition of Rust to use. Cargo gets your name and email information from your environment, probably from my Git environment. So if that information is not correct, fix the information now and then save the file. We'll talk about the addition key in Appendix E. All right. The last line dependencies is start of a section for you to list any of your project's dependencies. In Rust, packages of code are referred to as crates. Pretty cool. Cargo, crates. I like it. I like the semantics. Uh, we won't need any other crates for this project, but we will in the first project in chapter two. So we'll use the dependency section of this file. Very cool. Now open main RS and take a look. All right, so this is the one it generated. This is not the one I made. And if you notice here, I'm using a uh, extension VS code that shows the file types. I believe the default one now does this pretty well too, but you can see here, it's very tiny, but you can see my little Rust logo there. So pretty cool. Um, and you can see the main, it generated the same code, right? So nothing crazy. Um, it generated the same code, just like the one we wrote, exactly. The difference between our program are very similar, sir. Very small, right? The only difference is this is in a main, this is in a source directory, right? So this is where this goes. Uh, the top level project directory is just for, so this is where our source code is gonna go. The top level is just for readme files, license information, configuration files, and anything else not related to your code. So it's kind of telling you how to organize it, which is nice. Sometimes you jump into a language, <laughs> JavaScript, um, where things aren't very well stated on how they should be organized. So you get, you know, from project to project, it can vary extremely on how they're organizing things. So nice that they kind of made a decision here. Although JavaScript is similar to this now, we mostly would, you know, put stuff in our source directory. All right, Cargo expects your source files to live inside the source directory. We read that if you started a project that doesn't use Cargo, as we did with the Hello World project, you can convert it to a project that does use cargo, move the project code into a source directory and create the appropriate cargo.toml. Pretty cool. All right, building and running a cargo project. So this is going to be the cool part. So we're going to take a look at the difference when building a hello world program versus one with cargo. So we're going to run the command cargo build. Just clear that here. Cargo build. So it's, it's building, it says it finished, it finished dev unoptimized plus debug info. So it compiled it in an unoptimized dev mode. And here it created a target debug folder. Ooh, a lot of stuff here, a lot of stuff here. Let's see what we got. Let's see what it actually did. Uh, hello world should print in the terminal. Uh, well, first we have to actually run it. So let's do, it put the executable in target debug hello cargo. So let's run that. So target debug, hello cargo. So let's go ahead and run that. Target debug. Uh, you'll notice the, the little period before here, that means it's just gonna run. We're basically just navigating this file and we're gonna run it. Hello world, cool. All right, but whatever, we have the same thing. If anyone runs into error linking with link ext failed exit code one on Windows while compiling, just update your .NET framework. Thank you for the tip, Archangel. That is awesome and super helpful. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so we've run it. We did a lot of work, but for the same program. So let's see what Cargo is gonna do for us. 
Notice that this time we didn't see output indicating that Cargo was compiling. Cargo figured out that the files hadn't changed, so it just ran the binary. So we saw the first time that it compiled, the second time it didn't do that, it just ran it. If you had modified, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, here, if all goes well, hello world should print in the terminal. Uh, this file keeps track of the exact version of the dependencies. So that's this lock here that we have. So it would, if we had dependencies, it would show up right here, right? Um, we just built a project with cargo build and ran it with this. But we can also use cargo run to do both in the same command. So we don't have to know that the files in target debug hello cargo. We just run cargo run and there it ran it and printed out hello world. Very cool. So we didn't see the compiling step. You see it here. We didn't see it here. And that's because it already happened. If we modified our source code, uh, it would recompile. So let's modify our source code and get it to recompile. So instead of hello world, I'm going to say hello Twitch. And let's rerun it. And you can see now we actually do get the compiling step because I changed the code. Very cool. Um, Cargo also provides a command called cargo check. This command quickly checks your code to make sure it compiles, but doesn't produce an executable. That's kind of cool. And hello again to you, part-time lover. Um, so let's try it. So it's going to make sure that it compiles, uh, but not actually run it. So we're going to run cargo check. Um, and just to see, let's kind of mess this up a little bit and see if it fails. So I'm going to remove the double quote. So it's going to, it's not actually terminating this string. You can see it's complaining right here my editor. And if I highlight, it says unterminated double quote string. I'm going to save it, though, and I'm going to run cargo check. And you're going to see right there we got an awesome Rust error message. Another thing Rust is very popular for, fantastic error messages. And it tells you right here, unterminated double quote string. And it points to that piece of code. It uses snake. You can see it's going around here. See this? Goes around, points right to the thing, and tells us where the issue is. Um, and then it tells you a little message aborting due to previous error. So very cool. So check will allow us to do that without trying to run the code. Uh, now I'll check again and we're good to go. So pretty cool. Um, why would you not want an executable? Hmm. Often cargo check is much faster than cargo build because it skips the step of producing the executable. If you're continually checking your work while writing the code, using cargo check will speed up the process. As such, many of our stations run cargo check periodically as they write their program and make sure it compiles. Then they run cargo build when they're ready to use the executable. Now, if you were with us when we did the React Native, Tom Moro, can you move your face to the top right? Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. I absolutely can. And in fact, I can make my face much smaller so that I'm not annoying all of you. Good call. There we go. Let me delete this little stream thing here because we don't need that. Okay, can everyone see now? Is that better? All right. And I'll, yeah, good call. I'll move it around as needed. I can also shift my terminal back over. But hopefully that is still working for you. Uh, part time lover, just give me a thumbs up if that looks good, but I'll keep it like this anyway. Um, so, what we're going to do now is we are going to check out this part here. So, why would you not want an executable? So, we talked about here not wanting an executable because potentially um, it's faster to run it, right, running build. If you've used JavaScript or you're with us when we did the React Native, we were using Expo, which was rebuilding our code for us, right? It was in JavaScript, it was running a watcher that would look for changed files and rebuild. So if we did that, if you were building a watcher or maybe using one, it would probably use uh, cargo check rather than cargo build because it is indeed faster. So that's one benefit. All right. so. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so that's pretty cool. An additional advantage of using Cargo is that the commands are the same no matter which operating system you're working on. So at this point, we'll no longer provide specific instructions for Linux, Mac OS, or Windows. Kind of cool. All right, so it's going to be the same. Very good. Building for release. When your project is finally ready for release, you can use Cargo Build Release to compile it with optimizations. Again, we built it in dev mode, so it didn't have those optimizations. So. The command will create an executable and target release instead of target debug. Optimizations make your Rust code faster, but turning them on lengthens the time it takes for your program to compile. So we'll do that only when we're ready to actually build it for basically the final version. All right. Cargo as a convention. Let's check it out. 
With simple projects, Cargo doesn't provide a lot of value over just using Rust-C, but it will prove that it's worth, it's worth as your programs become more intricate. With complex projects composed of multiple crates, it's much easier to let Cargo coordinate the build. Very cool. This is exciting stuff. All right, so um, let's go ahead and see what we got here. Even though the Hello World project is simple, it now uses much of the real tooling you'll use in the rest of your Rust career. In fact, to work on any existing project, you can use the following commands to check out the code using Git, change that product's directory, and build. So if you pull down somebody else's Rust code and they built it with Cargo, you know how to run it, you know how to compile it, and build it. That's pretty awesome. All right. We made it here. Who's still with me, chat? Let's go. What do we got? You're already off to a great start on your Rust journey. In this chapter, you've learned how to install the latest stable version of Rust, right? With Rust up. We've updated to newer version of Rust, 1.46. 1.46 team in the chat here. Uh, we opened locally installed documentation. We wrote a Hello World program, and we also got started using Cargo. This is a great time to build a more substantial program to get used to reading and writing Rust. Woo! So in chapter two, we're going to build a guessing game program. If you would rather start by learning how common programming concepts work in Rust, see chapter three. Nah, <laughs> yo, <laughs> we're going chapter two, right? We're going in order. We're not going to skip around. This isn't a speed run. Hmm? It's in a speed run. Let's go. Programming a guessing game. Woo! I'm excited for this. All right. So I'll probably have to move my camera again once I start getting some code in here. But I'm not going to have the terminal open the whole time anyway, so that'll be fine. All right, let's jump into Rust by working through a hands-on project together. Let's do it. Let's do a chat. This chapter introduces you to a few common Rust concepts by showing you how to use them in a real program. We'll learn about let, match methods, associated functions, external crates, so using dependencies like npm if we we're in JavaScript, right? And more. Wow. All right. Let's implement a classic beginner programming problem, a guessing game. Here's how it works. The program will generate a random integer between 1 and 100. It will then prompt the player to enter a guess. After a guess is entered, the program will indicate whether the guess is too low or too high. If the guess is correct, the game will print a congratulatory message and exit. Wow. Eight hours straight. Let's go. Yeah, it's going to be a documentation marathon. But this is going to be great. Part-time lawyer, this is your first coding language. Oh, what a good first coding language. And I think it is a good first coding language because it'll get you able to do stuff that will you can see the benefits of learning to code. If there's anything you do on your computer, scripting that you want to automate, this would be a cool way to do it. I don't know if I could do eight hours straight marathon. We usually end at 11 p.m., but we'll see how far we go. Could be, you know, maybe if I had some G Fuel. <laughs> Sponsor. <laughs> Um, all right, so to set up a new project, go to the projects directory that you created in chapter one and make a new project using cargo like so. All right, so let me lower this here. Get down there. All right, we're going to go to our projects directory and we're going to use cargo to create a new product. So we're going to do cargo new guessing game. CD into guessing game. And you can see it created guessing game here. I'll close these out. There's guessing game. It's going to have our main. Again, it's doing hello world. We're kind of sick of this, right? We're going to get a real program going. Let's look at the toggle. <laughs> Let's look at the toggle. All right. Guessing game, version, name, addition. Obviously, we're 2020, but we don't want anyone to know it, right? Cargo toggle. If the author information obtained by your environment is incorrect, we can fix that. It's fine. We're going to stick with it. We see their Hello World program. We're going to run cargo run, cargo run, and see that it, in fact, runs our program. Good. We're set. The run command comes in handy when you need to rapidly iterate on a project, as we'll do this with this game, quickly testing each iteration before we move on to the next one. Great. So let's write some code. Processing a guest. A guest. Sorry. Guest. The first part of the guessing game program will ask you user for input, right? How can we let them guess if they can't input? Maybe they'll talk, maybe they'll, they're gonna type it, right? Uh, we're gonna process that input and check that the input is in the expected form. To start, we'll allow the player to input a guess, enter the code in listing two one. Okay, so let's enter this code and then I'm sure we will get to go through exactly what it is. So 
let me just make sure I'm dealing with the right main RS here. Okay. So the first line here, if we're, I'm going to kind of talk about this as I go, even though I'm sure we'll dive into actually what it's doing. I'm going to kind of infer or guess this is what I would do if I was learning it myself. So I'm kind of just going to speak out loud to what I'm thinking. Um, but I'm assuming this is an import, right? Um, something similar to import blank from blank in JavaScript or from blank import blank in Python. Uh, so it looks like standard IO is what we're importing, right? Standard error, standard in out. So far, so good. Uh, semicolon. And it gave me a nice little message. Let's see, what does this say? Wow. Yo, bam. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It gives us the documentation like that. I maybe, I've never seen this. I maybe TypeScript or JavaScript does this. I have not seen this. This is really, really cool. Uh, wow. I'm impressed. Okay. Function main. Print ln. Instead of hello world, we're going to say guess the number. All right. Uh, please input your guess, and we'll we'll you know we'll stick to whatever they're doing with the lines. Input output library. Yep. I O. Great input. Pun intended. Um, all right. Let's say please input your guess. Let. All right. So here, what I'm uh, we know the first two are prints. Here, what I'm guessing is we're declaring a new variable. And if I could guess, and I, like I said, I've seen a little bit of rust, so I have an, an idea. I'm not totally guessing out of blue. All right. Uh, mute means mutatable, uh, but we'll we'll get into that. Uh, it's saying that the variable is not used. That's fine. We'll get there in a minute. Although I do want to point out that it says variable does not need to be mutable. So I guess mute does mean mutable. Correct. It is the input output module from the standard library. That is absolutely correct, Archangel. Uh, so here mute we're saying that it's mutable uh no is with the question in the chat sorry if i missed it what was the extension that let you highlight the standard library see what it was um so i believe it's just the rust language extension so here i'll open up my extensions and i typed rust and i have this one installed rust for visual studio code um, it's the rust program language it should have around 600 uh, 40,000 downloads and i think that's the only one i have installed related to rust so it must be that one no problem. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, I think that's super cool. I always like to take advantage of this, this stuff. And so as we surmised, mute means mutable, but it's complaining because we haven't used it yet. Um, I'm excited to see what these double colons are about. It seems very Elixir or Ruby-esque. Um, also, my thing, I'm going to have to change this. I'll have to change this at a higher level, like in my settings. Um, but for now, I'm just going to go ahead and just change it to and use spaces just for now. But obviously the format will, will do this for me. Um, so standard in, so IO standard in, read line, it does some auto completion here. Uh, we're gonna just copy what it's saying to do here. And mute guess, all right, dot expect. So this must be if it's like an exception, almost like a catch, fail to read line. All right, and then we'll print ln you guess, and this is this is clearly a template string, uh, very similar to Python, um, where we are whatever we put here is going to be inserted here. So if you've used Python, um, I'll just type it down here. If you've used Python, you can do a string format. So if we had a string that says hello, and I put this. And I, oops, sorry. Hello with that. And I do dot format. I can put a variable here or another string. So I could do something like um, hello chat, right? And it'll input that there. So that's exactly what's happening here, but we're not calling uh, dot format on it, right? Because it's a functional language. So we're passing two arguments to this function. So pretty cool. All right, let's see what it's doing it's going to explain it to us so the code contains a lot of information of course right but they had us write it that's why we jumped into chapter two let's go over it line by line to obtain user input and then print the result as output we need to bring in the io which as archangel mentioned is the input output output library into scope the io library comes from the standard library which is known as std so a lot of uh, languages have a standard library node famously does not but it 
there is a project that is bringing one, although Deno, the new version of Node, TypeScript, written in Rust, written in Rust, does have a standard library. AJVN, line 11, at mute. That's pointer to a mute, mutable variable so it doesn't copy it, right? I am not sure. I will. I think it's going to tell us in a second, but I believe you're right um, because we know that guess is mutable and at mute, I am sure, will be a pointer to that variable, but let's find out. Um, maybe it does. It looks like the way it's doing it, it might actually store... Yeah, it'll actually store the input into that originally created variable, I believe, because it's mutatable. But we will find out. Great question, AJVN. I think we'll find out in a second. So um, we have our standard library input output library pulled in. Great. And that's what this line is. By default, Rust brings only in, only in a few types into the scope of every program in the prelude. Let's see what the prelude is. Rust comes with a variety of things in its standard library. However, if you uh, had to manually import every single thing that you use, it would be very verbose. But importing a lot of things that a program never uses isn't good either. So the prelude is a balance. It's, it's bringing in stuff that's commonly used, sounds like. Cool. OK, so um, if a type you want to use isn't in the prelude, you have to bring that type into scope explicitly with a use statement. Using SDD colon colon IO, standard IO, library provides you with a number of useful features, including the ability to accept user input. Mm. All right. The function syntax declares new function. We saw this before. The parentheses have nothing inside them, so there's no arguments to the function. Again, we covered that. And we start our function body with the curly brace. We learned about print ln macro, right? That's what the exclamation point is. We're printing guess the number. Please input your guess. Uh, this code is printing the prompt to the user. All right, here's the nitty gritty. We're going to get into AJVN's question here. Storing variable values and storing values with variables. Sorry. Next, we'll create a place to store the user input like this. Let mute guess equal string new. Now the program is getting interesting. It sure is, Rust. It sure is. There's a lot going on in this little line. Notice that this is a let statement, which is used to create a variable. Here's another example, let foo equal bar. So this is just like we would see in JavaScript, right? Or Swift, if you use that. Uh, this line creates a new variable named foo and binds it to the value of the bar variable. In Rust, variables are immutable di by default. If any of you are not familiar with the term immutable, immutable, it just means whether or not it can be modified. Robotudo, thank you for the follow. Appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying learning the rest of this. So um, mutable means it can be changed. Immutable means it can't. Mm D, nice. Thank you for the follow. Hope you're enjoying learning Rust. Thanks, everyone, in the chat, too, for participating. This is really fun. I'm enjoying it. So thanks for the follows, everybody. OK, so. Immutable means it can't be modified. Mutable means it can be modified, which I think is why we prefaced guess with mute, and we'll find out right now. We'll be discussing this concept in detail in the variables and mutability section in chapter three. The following example shows how to use mute before the variable name to make a variable mutable. So we have let foo equal five, immutable. Let mute bar equal five, mutable. So that means bar can be modified and foo cannot. So that's pretty cool. Uh, what you may ask what the benefits of mutability and immutability are. There's a lot of benefits. When you deal with immutable code, you can guarantee the type of an object right at, at front time and compile time because you know it cannot be changed. Um, another benefit of um, immutable code is you know that something can never be changed. So it's easy to reason about what happens to a value. You know that it's not going to change. It's always going to have a certain value and you create, if you want to modify it, you would create a copy of it and then modify that. So it makes things easy to reason about. Um, that said, uh, it does make things like, you know, you'll have to copy stuff more. So if you want to modify an object, you'll have to make a copy of it and add to it. So it does use more memory, but on the types of machines that we are running code today, that's actually not the bottleneck, right? So it's actually pretty beneficial to have immutable code because it's type safe and adds safety and can be fast because we know that the program can make inferences about that thing more easily. Then if you have mutated code, then at any given time, the value of that thing can be anything. Um, and in, in not typed languages like plain JavaScript, right? It could not, not only be any type of number or string, it could be anything. So you can go from a string to a number and, and back and forth. So there is benefits in immutability and you'll see a lot of pure functional languages will use immutability because of its advantages. 
Uh, so in this case, we're using mutability because we're going to accept user input and we want to let them modify the value of guess. Okay. Note that the comma com the slash slash is a uh, comment. So that's just like JavaScript, right? Uh, so we could put you know this is a comment, right? Very cool. Let's return to the guessing game program. All right. So you know that let mute guess will introduce a mutable variable named guess, a changeable variable named guess. On the other side of the equal sign is the value that guess is bound to. So in this case, it's a new string, which is the result of calling string new, a function that returns a new instance of a string. A string is a string type provided by the standard library that is growable. Growable is important, right? Um, it means we don't have to declare how long the string is in advance. Growable means it can grow. In other languages, sometimes you have to say the string will be of length n or the array will be of length n. Um, so the colon colon syntax in the new indicates that new is an associated function of the string type. An associated function is implemented on a type, in this case string, rather than on a particular instance of a string. Some languages call this a static method. Let me give you an example. Um, if you've used JavaScript and you used map or for each, you know that map and for each can be called on an instance of an array so if you have an array called my array you can call dot map dot for each reduce on that instance however array has static methods as well such as is array right you've seen when we use array we'll say array dot is array it's a static method so in this case string new is a static method or a method that is an, an associated function. So it's it's on the string type, whereas we're not going to call dot new on guess, even though guess is a string, we won't do it because it's part of it's an associated function to the method string. If any of that's not clear or you have any more questions or that is ambiguous or strange, feel free to message in the chat and I'll try to answer your questions. But that's kind of the difference. And I would think about the example of, you know, calling dot map on an instance of an array in JavaScript. Uh, versus saying something like object.new or object.entries. We wouldn't do, you know, the object.entries. We would say the word object.entries. Okay, so the new function creates a new empty string. You'll find a new function on many types because it's a common name for a function that makes a new value of some kind. Cool. To summarize, the let mute guess equals string new. Line has created a new mutable variable that is currently bound to a new empty instance of a string. So... Cool. Let me just down here. Oh, I'm just going to go ahead and cancel this Python thing. And just basically say what it's saying is that we have guess equals and guess is modifiable. So it's equal to an empty string and it's modifiable. OK, so whew, it says, whoo, look, whoo, that's, exactly, that's how I'm feeling, baby. You understand? That's how I'm feeling. That's great. Recall that we included the input output functionality from the standard library with used standard IO uh, on the first line of the program. Now we'll call the standard in function from the IO module. So we're going to actually use something from the IO module. So IO colon colon standard in calling that function and then dot reline. Let's see what this does. If we hadn't put the use standard IO line at the beginning of the program, we could have written this function call as standard IO standard in so basically what it's saying is by doing this we don't have to type this portion anymore this standard colon colon it's saying we're going to be using this kind of like namespace it and now we can just use io colon colon standard in and look i'm hovering and it's giving me the instructions with the link to the docs let's go this is so sick i love it um okay but because we put that we can actually just reference it as io colon colon standard in the standard in function returns an instance of standard io standard in so you capital S here, a handle to the standard input stream of a process. So we'll get into this in a second, which is a type that represents a handle to the standard input for your terminal. So the standard input for your terminal is what we're, when we type, that's standard input. The job of read line is to take whatever the user types into the standard input. So whatever I type in the terminal and place that into a string. So it takes that string as an argument. Uh, the string argument needs to be mutable so the method can change the string's content by adding the user input. Let's break that down, all right? It's saying read line will take 
the input from your terminal. So it will prompt you for terminal input. It will take what it gets from the terminal input and put it in whatever you put here as the first argument. It has to though, whatever variable we're putting there has to be mutable, otherwise it can't put it there. If it was immutable, it wouldn't be able to change it. Archangel, so colon colon, it's used for connecting libraries, modules, functions. Yes, yeah, so it looks like the colon colon is used to call associated functions or functions that exist on a certain type, not an instance. So in this case, we're calling IO, which exists on the standard library. We're calling standard in or read line in this case, which exists on standard in of the IO library. So yes, yeah, so it's looks like they're associated with those, those actual, um, their static methods essentially. So if we had an instance of something, it wouldn't be the case that we would use colon colon. So here, um, again, so read line expects a mutable variable. And we're gonna see in a second why we're putting at mute, this ampersand mute in front of it. Okay, the next part of the code, read line at mute calls the read line method on the standard library input, method on the standard input handle to get the input from the user. We're also passing one argument to read line. Ampersand mute guess. The job of readline is to take whatever the user input types again and put it in the place, right? Put it inside that variable. That variable has to be mutable. Shadow program. How did you get the book like that on the left? Ah, great question. So the way I split my screen up to left and right is I use this app called Rectangle. Um, actually, in this case, I'm using the old one called Spectacle. Uh, it's a window manager for Mac OS, but the new version is called Rectangle. So check it out. It's very cool. Oh, well, you mean like, <laughs> looks like it's in a browser. So this actually is in the browser. So I pulled up the browser version. I didn't pull up the doc that's installed with Rust. I actually went to the to the browser and pulled it up here. So I will paste it here. There you go. That's a link to the browser version of the, the Rust book. It is a free book, yes. Um, so, and it's it comes with every installation of the Rust language as well. So it's on your computer if you've installed Rust, but yep, it's free documentation. All right, so the next part of the code, we saw this, so we know that the string argument needs to be mutable so that it can take whatever the user inputs and put it in that string. <laughs> will Rust help you get hired? I think it will, it depends on what you're trying to do. I think it's gonna help just be a better programmer. So yeah, possibly. Okay, the ampersand. The ampersand indicates that this argument is a reference. So this goes back uh, to what, if we scroll up in the chat, we had a question here regarding this from AJVN. This goes back to your question. Um, so the ampersand indicates that this argument is a reference, so you are correct, which gives you a way to let multiple parts of your code access one piece of data without needing to copy that data into memory multiple times. So it's almost like allowing, let's say I have my phone, right? This is a cool way to think about it. Let's say I have my phone. If I want to allow other people to access my phone, I could either make a copy of it, hand it over to them, or I could tell them where it is and they can come get it. And so that's what a reference is. It's saying, hey, my phone or my, my variable is here. If you need to borrow it, come and get it here. It's in one place and then we're all referencing the same one. So we're not making copies of guess, we're using the mutable guess and we're using the reference to it. So very different than if you've done JavaScript per se, like if you've done JavaScript or Python, uh, this isn't something, if you've done C, you've probably deallocated, you know, you've referenced and used ampersands, but um, this is what's going to make Rust different, right? Rust is not garbage collected, we'll get into that. But the important thing is it's gonna make us manage memory and make us do things in a way that is what's ultimately gonna allow our programs to be fast. All right, so let's see what we got. Um, it'll help you learn about things that will lead to the tools that will help you get hired. Yes, no, it's definitely gonna help with that. It's also just, it's gonna teach us lower level systems programming, which will allow us to write scripts. And anytime you learn a new programming language, listen, whether you use it at work or you use it directly, uh, you're gonna gain the benefits, especially learning a systems programming language. It'll teach you a lot about programs. That's why in school we learn about Java and, and we start with Java, but we also learn about C and assembly. It's just nice to see what's going on. And hey, it doesn't hurt to learn a fast typed functional language like Rust that's extremely popular and can let you do some really powerful things on your machine. What's the downside to references? Why not always use them? That's a great question. So when we are modifying something, we will use references. Why not always use them is a great question. So a language like JavaScript, you'll often see us using the spread operator or doing things where we copy um, 
values, and that's so that we can avoid mutation. So giving something a reference to something that's mutable lets that thing mutate it. We actually are letting readLine mutate this variable, which is great for what we're trying to do. But in a program with a lot going on, when you're passing things around, you don't want to let things mutate uh, your reference arbitrarily. And that's because you want to be able to reason about what's happening in your code. You want to know that something will stay what it is regardless of what function it gets passed to. If you pass your code to a function that, let's say you pass a and B to a function called add, you expect it to return the result of A and B. But what if it returned the result of A and B, but at the same time converted B to a different number or to a negative number? Um, so that's what the downside of using references and, and mutation is, is it can do, you can have some weird side effects if your code is doing weird things. Um, and But the benefit of using a reference here is, is we're actually able to manage who can manipulate things. So it's a little more controlled. So I'm, I'm sure we'll learn more about that as they, they start to explain it, but I think it's kind of cool. Definitely a little bit of overhead, right? This is not something we would deal with in JavaScript. We could just mutate whatever the hell we want, right? So let's see. So it gives us a, a reference, right? With let's um, gives you a way to let multiple parts of your code modify it. Okay, so here we're gonna dive into a little bit. References are a complex feature, and one of Rust's major advantages is how safe and easy it is to use references. You don't need to know a lot of those details to finish this program. For now, all you need to know is that like variables, references are immutable by default. Pretty cool. Hence, you need to write ampersand mute guess rather than ampersand guess. So that's cool to make it mutable. Chapter four will explain references more thoroughly. So we'll get there, right? We'll dive into chapter four, we'll get there. Why they call it a variable if it's not a variable, not mean. Uh, it, yeah, that's interesting. It, a lot of languages like JavaScript will call it a constant. Um, I think this does have constants, Rust does have constants. Um, and we'll see, I think they're technically the reason it's called a variable even if it's immutable is because of a feature we'll see in a little bit called shadowing. Um, We'll get there. It, it is variable, even though it's immutable. We'll see in a second. Um, OK, handling potential failure within the result type. So this is what the expect is. We're still working on this line of code. Damn, we've been going at this one line. But well, let's see. We're still working on this line of code, although we're now discussing a third line of the text. It's still part of the same line, and that's why we have our dots and the nice indentation. The next part is expect fail to read line. When you call a method with foo, in the bracket syntax, it's often wise to introduce a new line in other white space to help break things up. Otherwise, we could have written it like this. So it's showing you, we could have written this with one line, but it looks nicer if we break it up like this. And I agree, I think it looks nice. So we'll stick with it. However, one line's difficult to read, right? As mentioned earlier, read line puts what the user types into the string we're, we're passing it. So it puts what I typed, blah, 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 into guess, right? Into the string we're typing. But it also returns a value. In this case, IO result. So that's a type. Result has a number of types named result. Rust has a number of types named result. It's in its standard library, a generic result, as well as specific versions of submodules such as IO result. So that it's a type. So if remember when we use TypeScript, we had types. Result is a type, and this is a specific version of a result. So imagine in TypeScript we have HTML element. This is like HTML input element, right? A specific type. For result, the variants are OK or error. So it's a union type of either OK or error. It can be OK or it can be an error. The OK variant indicates the operation was successful and the inside and inside OK is the successfully generated value, that string that we typed or we will type. The error, the error or error variant <laughs> means the operation failed and error, error contains information about how or why the operation failed. So it's saying that standard in can return a type. The type is IO result. IO result can either be OK and have the value, and we can go on with our day, or it can be an error, and it'll contain that error. And if it's an error, it'll go to that expect. And so you can see here, I'm just going to demonstrate something. If I get rid of that, it's going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa locks this handle and reads a line of input appending so it tells us what it does but let's see it'll say here in yellow the reason it's yellow is unused standard result result that must be used so it's saying this result may be an error variant which should be handled it's telling us yo you be you're playing fast and loose with rust you know 
So we got to put our expect. So pretty cool. This is like one of the benefits, right? So if your input is, for example, one, two, three, will it throw an error as it's not a string? Will it convert it to a string automatically? Great question. And they are going to talk about this. It will be an error because this is a type slave language, right? So if we were to type something that's not a string, you're going to see in a second, it's going to make us do some work to actually take that input and convert it to a string. Uh, so I believe it will throw an error. We can try it. We'll try it in a second. But yes, that is a great question. You're going to see it's going to make us do some conversion to convert that into a string. So yeah, it would throw an error. I would have made the er variant roar. Nice. Yep. Yeah, it growls at us. All right. So for result, ready? Error and OK. Got it. The purpose of these result types is to encode error handling information. Values of the result type, like values of any type, have methods defined on them. An instance of IO result has an expect method that you can call. Uh, so if you remember promises, when we use them in JavaScript, we have dot then, we have dot catch. So yeah, so we'll have to check uh, what the type is. Uh, if this instance of IO result is an error value, uh, expect will cause the program to crash and display the message that you passed as an argument to expect. If the read line method returns error, it would likely be the result of an error coming from the underlying operating system. If this instant of IO result is an OK value, expect will take the return value that OK is holding and return just that value to you so you can use it. In this case, that value is the number of bytes in what the user entered into standard input. So if it's OK, catch, expect will just pass along the OK value. We'll, trigger anything if you don't call expect the program will compile but you'll get a warning which we saw when we hovered over it rust warns you that you haven't used the result value return from read line indicating the program hasn't handled a possible error which we saw printing values with print ln placeholders so this is the string templating uh, so uh, we put this bracket here and the second argument will fill in that bracket so the line prints the string we saved to the user's input the set of curly brackets is a placeholder think of them as little crab pincers that hold the value in place. I like that. We're Rustations now, right? You can print more than one value using curly brackets. The first set of curly brackets holds the first value and so on. And so you can he see here, x, y. So that's a good example. All right, so let's test the first part. Cargo run. Please input your guess. So I'm going to show, I'm going to put a number. And it worked. So it said, I guess, 12. So it didn't complain. That's good. Um, let's see if I do test. And that's probably because we are modifying guess, which is okay. And so it's letting us put whatever we want. Let's see if I put, uh, so it is just taking it as a string. So I guess ADVN is correct. It's just taking it as a string, but you're going to see in a second, we're actually going to handle it and convert it to a number. And that's where the type checking will come in. So right now it is parsing our standard input and providing a string. And I bet if we were to highlight over a read line, we would see that, yeah. So it, it'll take it and convert it to a string. So let's see. At this point, the first part of the game is done. We're getting input from the keyboard and then printing it. So we have that, but it's not a very useful program. It's not even a game. It's just printing our input. If I wanted to print our input, I could have done anything. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So generating a secret number. Ooh. Next, we need to generate a secret number that the user will try to guess. Yeah. The secret number should be different every time so the game is fun to play more than once. Let's use a random number between 1 and 100 so the game isn't too difficult but creates some level of difficulty. Um, Rust doesn't yet include a random number functionality in its standard library. However, the Rust team does provide a rand crate. So crates are going to be similar to what we use with Node. When we use npm packages, we're going to use a crate that's going to let us pull in a different functionality. So let's go ahead and click that and check it out takes us to crates.io, which is kind of like the NPM site, right? If you've seen that. Um, so pretty cool. Replay value. Yeah, the replay value is super high in this game right now. So our RAND crate, and it has the awesome documentation for it. And so the book's going to tell us now how to install and use our RAND crate for generating a random number. All right. Using a crate to get more functionality. Remember that a crate is a collection of Rust source code files. The project we've been building is a binary crate, which is an executable. The RAND crate is a library crate, which contains code intended to be used in other programs. So it's for sharing code with other programs. Cargo's use of external crates is where it really shines. 
Before we can write code that uses Rand, we need to modify the cargo.toml so that we can include Rand as a dependency in our dependencies section. So let's go over to our cargo.toml. Remember, you know, any of you forgot cargo.toml stands for Tom's. Come on. Obvious markdown language, right? I think, right? What does it stand for? Obvious minimal language. It's named after me. I don't even know. <laughs> Come on. Tom's obvious minimal language. Very cool. All right. So let's add Rand, Randy, as a dependency here 0.5.5. Now, we could do this. If you look here, if you're familiar with package managers in general, you could also just look here and see the version that's the latest. Um, we'll use the version that the book says because we don't want to get messed up and you know, we'll just stick with what the book says. So we'll go ahead and use Rand 5.5. So this is semantic versioning again, and that's good. In the cargo.toml file, everything that follows a header is part of a section that continues until another section starts. The dependency section is where you'll tell cargo which external crates your project depends on. Is there a way of indicating it should use the latest version available? That's a great question. Um, yes. So I believe there is. And here they're saying Cargo understands semantic versioning, which is a standard uh, for writing libraries. The number 505 is actually shorthand for this, which means any version that has a public API compatible with version 5.5. I'm sure, I imagine, like using um, NPM, we could probably do something like at latest. But let's find out, because that's a great question. Cargo, we're going to search cargo.toml specify latest version specifying dependencies ah so here cargo should update to the version if the latest uh let's see is there another way to specify is there a way to actually specify the latest so sometimes let's see latest release would not update to so it looks like you can specify versions like this greater than or less than I don't see anything with at latest, although generally, if it's if I'm thinking like npm, when you run the install command, you'd say latest to get the latest, but you generally don't wanna always update to latest because you wanna make sure the version you're using works. So you usually stick to a certain semantic versioning number, whether it be, usually you'd stick to a, a given major, a given minor, and allow your patch to be flexible, right? Because that's non-breaking changes. Um, but I'm sure when we install it, we could deal with the command. Is RAND supposed to give you a random number? It looks like you're telling it the number. Good question. So yes, RAND is supposed to give me a random number. What I'm doing here is not telling you what number. I'm telling you what version of the RAND library I should be using. That's a great question. So this is saying I want to use version 0.5.5 of the RAND number library. Um, so you can see here, in this case, we'll specify RAND create with the semantic version specifier. Cargo understands semantic versioning, sometimes called Semver, which is a standard for writing version numbers. So you can read more about semantic versioning. It basically has major, minor, patch. That's what each section is. A patch will be when something's updated without breaking changes. A minor will be something's updated without breaking changes, possible deprecations, but possible added features. And a major patch means, hey, we might break some of the old features. So that's why we can specify this, which means any version that has a public API compatible with version 0.5.5. So let's do that because um, I think as long as we're compatible with this, we should be fine to go ahead and continue working. Okay, now without changing any of the code, let's build the project. So let's run cargo build and it should pull in our latest dependency, which is Rand. Um, so I have to save this first. So you'll see nothing happened. So I'm gonna save that file. Blocking, waiting for a file lock on package cache. You can see something running here. Ah, it might be because I have a file lock on this because I have it open. Let's cancel that. Waiting for file lock on package cache. Let's see what this is. There we go. Blocking with updating crates IO index. There we go. Building, compiling, RAND core, RAND core. That sounds hardcore. So it's pulling in RAND core. All right, and finished. So we now we have that random number package. Now we can use it. That's awesome. Let's go ahead and use it. All right, so you may see different version numbers, but they're all compatible with the code. That's good. Thanks to semantic versioning. 
Now that we have an external dependency, Cargo fetches the latest versions of everything from the registry, which is a copy of data from crates.io. Crates.io is where people in the Rust ecosystem post their open source Rust projects for others to use. Pretty cool. Thank you to everyone who has contributed to crates.io. We appreciate it and your hard work is allowing us to benefit now. So that's awesome. So thanks to anyone who contributed. After updating the registry, Cargo checks the dependency section and downloads any crates you don't have yet. In this case, although we only listed RAND as a dependency, Cargo also grabbed libc and RAND core because RAND had a dependency on those packages. So this is very similar to what we'd see in the Node ecosystem with NPM or the Python ecosystem with pip, right? Uh, if you immediately run Cargo build again without making changes, you won't get any output because it's already finished, right? It's already done it once. Okay, so let's skip over here. If you open up source main rs file make a trivial change and then save it and build again you'll only see two lines of output compiling and finished these lines show cargo only updates the build with your tiny change to the main.rs file your dependency haven't changed so it doesn't do anything with them that's awesome that's fantastic okay ensuring reproducible builds the cargo.lock this is going to be like our package lock right it's going to specify which ver versions you're currently using and it'll be able to reproduce that so it has a mechanism to ensure you can rebuild the same artifact every time you or anyone else builds your code. Cargo will use only the version of the dependencies you specified until you indicate otherwise. Very cool. So it just is gonna lock it inside that cargo lock. Uh, to answer uh, to this problem is the cargo lock file, which was created the first time we ran cargo build, and now you're guessing a directory when you build a project for the first time. It figures out all the versions you need. So here we have our cargo lock and it has all the versions. So let's look, let's see, we got Win API, Rand Core, Rand, libc, guessing game. So pretty cool. All right, updating a crate to get a new version. When you do want to update a crate, you can provide another command update, which will ignore the cargo lock file. So if we want an update, we can run cargo update. Pretty cool. Uh, let's run it. And we should get the latest version of Rand. Updating crates.io index. Cool. Um, and let's see, did anything change? We got 5.6, so it updated us to keep us in line with our semantic versioning. So we got 5.6, which is what they said here. If you want to use RAND version 6 or any other version, you'd update Cargo YAML to look like this. Next time you run Cargo Build, Cargo will update the registry of crates available, reevaluate your RAND requirements according to the new version you've specified. Very cool. All right, so let's get into generating this random number. So it says here, the next step is to update source main as shown in 2.3. So let's update our code. So first we're gonna pull in RAND. So similar to what we did before, we're gonna say RAND and we're gonna pull in RNG, which we'll figure out what that is in a second. We're printing guess the number and we're gonna create a immutable variable. So immutable, meaning we can't change it. Uh, otherwise we put mute in front, secret number equals, and we're calling rand, we're calling the associated function thread rng, which I have no idea what that does yet. Gen range, which we know we can put on a separate line, but we'll put it here. Gen range one, 101. I'm assuming um, this is gonna generate a number between this range, and I'm assuming this second number, this first number is inclusive, one, and this must be exclusive, so it'll only go to 100. It'll say up to 101. Interesting syntax choice, but I'm assuming that's what that's going to do. Um, then it's printing the secret number, which, hey, this is not a souls like, right? We're just going to give away the answer right away. It's not going to be challenging at all. Um, this is just for us to see. The secret number is, and then we'll pass it secret number. All right. And then please input your guess. We're collecting the guess. This part's the same. This part's the same. Uh, this part is messed up, so I'm just going to go ahead and fix that. It seems weird that we import the RNG module from RAND, but we don't use it explicitly. Yes, I agree. That is strange. Um, whereas in this case, we're using IO explicitly here, but here we're not using RNG. You'd think it'd be like RAND colon colon RNG thread RNG. So that is interesting. I'm wondering if we need to say rand or if we could just say rng here um, let's see if i hover over this we see rng core if we hover over this 
Yeah, it is interesting. Let's see if they explain it, but that is that is strange. So it says here, first we add the use line. The RNG trait defines methods that random number generators implement. And this trait must be in scope for us to use those methods. Chapter 10 will cover traits in detail. Okay, so it looks like they'll get into it a little bit later in chapter 10. But yeah, that is, I agree, that is very odd because like it's not intuitive, right? The first one, you're using standard IO. The next one, that is weird. Next, we're adding two lines in the middle. The ran thread RNG function will give us the particular random number generator that we're going to use, one that is local to the current thread of execution and seeded by the operating system. So my assumption here, when they say local to the current thread is that we could spin up new threads to do this. And there's languages that do that, right? In Elixir, we could use a random number module that'll spin up a new process to asynchronously generate a random number and then give it back to us. This is gonna do it on the current thread. So blocking, almost synchronous, if you think about it like JavaScript, synchronously get us a new random number um, seeded by the operating system. So it's gonna ask the OS to actually generate that. Pretty cool. Then we call genRange method on the random number generator. This method is defined by the RNG trait that we brought into scope with the use rand RNG statement. The gen range method takes two numbers as arguments. As I mentioned, the first one is inclusive lower bound and the second one is an exclusive upper bound. So it's going to go from one to 100. Got to bounce. Loving this new endeavor. We'll catch up and see you next week. Tom for life. Thank you, Noah Berm. Samuel M, what up? Thank you for joining. Loving the Power Rangers emojis. Awesome. Yes, multi-threading. It is going to be interesting to see where we get. All right, so let's see what we got here. So we're talking about the gen range method, inclusive on the lower bound, exclusive on the upper bound. We're going to go 1 to 100. That's what this part is here. Makes sense. Okay, let me move. Sorry, I've got to move my camera out of the way here so you could all see. Let's move that down there. There we go. Whatever, that'll be fine that over a little bit okay so now you can see my gen range is 1 to 100 there cool all right so next what do we got going on here uh it says here note you won't just know which trait to use and which methods and functions to call from a crate instructions for using a crate are in each crate's documentation so that's a little reassuring it's saying hey it's not like tribal knowledge like we're just going to know maybe after we use it we'll know but the best way to do it is to check out the docs. Another neat feature of Cargo, Cargo is that you can run the cargo doc open command, which will build documentation provided for all of your dependencies locally and open the browser. That's awesome, let's try that. That seems super cool. So let's run cargo doc open. And it said locally, so hey, I don't even have internet connection. I'm commuting on the train. I wanna read the docs. I don't need to reach out to the internet to read them. Come on, that's pretty fantastic. I like that. And again, it's not like whatever is installed on your machine for Rust, like the docs and things are going to be deployed when you deploy your program. So you don't have to worry about the space they take up, right? They take it up on your local machine. But when you deploy your program, remember, you're just deploying the binary. So really cool. Wow, this is awesome. So you can see it generated a nice static website for me where I can do a little searching. Uh, we have all the crates that I have. Obviously, some of these I didn't explicitly specify as a dependency, but they are a dependency of one of my dependencies. So libc is a dependency of rand, as is rand core. Uh, but here, check it out. I can go right to rand. There's the documentation. That's pretty awesome. Look, it even has guessing game here, main. This is pretty cool. This is actually really, really nice. It's super convenient. Again, if you're commuting yeah, you're, yeah, on the train, I know nowadays, People are traveling. We're trying to take vacations. I don't know if you're if you're coding Rust out in the middle of the woods. You have access to your docs. So very very cool there. I really like that. Okay, the second line that we added in the middle of the code prints the secret number. This is useful while we're developing the program. Obviously, we're going to delete in the final version. We don't want to give away the answers, right? This is an easy mode. Um, so let's go ahead and run cargo run. That's what they're saying to do. Um, so again, just to walk through really quick before we run it importing the RAND module. We don't, again, there's a bit of a question on why we're not using RNGs explicitly, but they said that they would get into it a little bit. The difference thing here is we're setting, let secret number, it's an immutable variable. Again, we didn't include mute, so it's immutable. Uh, we're generating a random number using thread RNG from one to 100, and we're gonna print it. So let's run cargo run. Building, 
it says guess the number the secret number is 91 i'm gonna guess 91 there's no we didn't finish the game yet so we're gonna continue let's see where we go okay so we ran the program it gives secret number i'm gonna go ahead and run it again as they said and you can see it keeps giving me a different number obviously it doesn't have a check yet on my you know guess or anything like that but it's giving me a different number so that's pretty cool what happens if i put a string well nothing yet no checking there yet so let's get into that a bit okay we got different random numbers so we're good they're between 1 and 100 so that's pretty great okay so now what are we gonna do uh comparing the guess to the secret number so this is where we actually start getting into the comparison and doing the if statements and diving in and seeing what's going on so now we have a user input and a random number we can compare them so we have our input random number compare. the step is shown in listing 24 note that this code won't compile quite yet and they'll explain why so let's type it out and then we'll see why it doesn't compile so first i'm going to go here and i'm going to go ahead and change our after the you guess part i'm going to put this code so first it says i have to import standard compare ordering so let's do that use std cmp ordering match guess dot cmp we're going to grab a reference to secret number that's what the ampersand is ordering less so it looks like this is almost like a switch case if it's less we'll print ln too small if it's greater print too big and if it's just right aka equal we'll print you win all right and it looks like these are separated by commas looks like they do like trailing commas in rust hence the last comma at the end there um, and it says it's not going to compile let's take a look ourselves at why we think it might not compile mismatch types expected struck std string string found integer because our secret number as we saw up here is a randomly generated integer ajvn thank you for popping by appreciate it you have a great night and join us next week for some more rust so all right so it's saying that this is expecting a string found integer expect a reference string found reference integer all right so we'll see what is going to happen there all right clan watson see you as well all right so let's see here what's going on what we're going to do is the first new bit here is another use statement so we're pulling in ordering we're pulling in this ordering uh from the standard library here into scope from the standard library like result ordering is another enum but the variants for ordering are less greater and equal so those are the options so we saw that result could be okay or error we're now seeing that ordering can be less greater or equal these are the three outcomes that are possible when you compare two values absolutely then we add five new lines at the bottom that use the ordering type the compare method compares two values and can be called on anything that can be compared it takes a reference to whatever you want to compare it with here it's comparing the guest to the secret number then it returns a variant of ordering enum we brought into scope with the use statement so it's saying it can't compare guess and secret number so number is an integer guess is a string it can't compare them we're going to need to convert guess into an integer so then it returns variant order them we brought into scope uh, we use a match expression to decide what to do next based on which variant of ordering was returned from the compare call so this compare call is going to return an ordering we then do a match statement to see which one we actually got so pretty cool um so we're going to use so basically what we're going to see is what we got back from comparing guess and the secret number a match expression is made up of arms uh so some people you know in other languages might call these branches like in your if statement or conditions uh in rust it looks like they're going to call them arms an arm consists of a pattern and the code that should be run if the given if the value given to the beginning of the match expression 
fits that pattern, right? So if it fits that pattern, it's going to run that part of the arm. The match construct and patterns are powerful features in Rust that let you express a variety of situations your code might encounter and make sure that you handle them all. Pretty cool. These features will be covered in detail in chapter six and 18 respectively. All right, so we'll get more into it. Apples and oranges, exactly. We can't compare strings and integers. It's not going to work. Thanks, Archangel. So let's walk through an example that would happen uh, with the match expression used here. Say that the user has guessed 50 and the, ra and the randomly generated secret number is 38. When that code executes and compares 50 to 38, the compare method will return ordering greater because 50 is greater than 38 and we would see too big printed there on the screen. Um, right, and so the value, in, it starts running that arm and then prints that. Uh, it looks at the first arm's pattern. So it sees ordering less as the first arm's pattern. We skip over it. It does not run that code. It sees ordering greater. That is the one it needs to run. It runs it and it never runs the equal one. So it makes sense. The associated code in that arm will be executed. However, the code in listing 2.4 won't compile yet. So let's try to compile it like it's saying to do here. We're going to run cargo build and we get an error. It's saying it can't compare a string to an integer, just like the same error we saw here. So it's really nice that it kind of like pre-compiled, right? And then gave us a, the hint right there. So that's pretty cool. Um, so the core of the error states that there is a mismatch type against strings and integers. When we wrote mute guest string new, Russ was able to infer that guest should be a string. And it didn't make us write a type. The secret number, on the other hand, is a number type. A few number types can have a value between 1 and 100. An I32, which is a 32-bit number. So again, this is a lower level systems program language. So we're not just gonna have integers and floats. We're gonna have different types of, of numbers here. And that's where we get into the lower level stuff. And it allows us to do some powerful stuff, but it's something we're gonna have to learn. So I32 is a 32-bit integer. U32 is an unsigned 32-bit integer. Unsigned meaning it doesn't have a positive or negative sign. Um, I64, which is a 64-bit number, as well as others. Rusty falls to an I32, which is a signed 32-bit integer, which is the type of secret number, unless you add type information elsewhere that would cause Rust to infer a different numerical type. So we could tell it, hey, it's going to be a type U32, which is unsigned. Uh, but in this case, it's going to, by default, use I32. The reason for the error is that Rust cannot compare a string and a number type. Just as we inferred and just as Archangel said in the chat, we cannot compare apples to oranges. Ultimately, we want to convert to a, the string uh, the program read from the input as user to a number so that we could do the comparison, right? Uh, so we're going to modify our main body like this, and then we'll get into what it's actually doing, which I'm excited about. So you can see the modification here is this other line, let guess u32. Uh, so this may come as a shocker. They're going to get into it. So you can see we're defining mutable guess, and then here we're like redefining it in like an immutable way. We're going to see what that is. Um, but so I'm going to go ahead and write that out. So right here, we're going to do let guess u32. So we're saying guess is going to be a 32-bit integer. Just trust us. Nani? Yeah, yeah, right? It's a um, it's it's shadowing. It's interesting. All right, we're going to see what it is. So guess, we're taking guess, we're trimming it, which I'm assuming is going to cut off the, if it's like JavaScript, cut off the white space, the new lines. Generally, when you have something in standard input, after you type it, it always appends a new line to the end. I'm assuming it's going to cut that off. We're going to parse it, which is just probably like JSON parse. We're going to parse the string as the integer. I'm going to call dot expect, please. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these. I can put these on a new line. We'll see what the formatter does, though. Please type a number. So now we're actually doing the type checking. So if we don't type a number, it should trigger the expect block, the error, and throw the error. All right, so we have you guessed guess. Okay, so now let's dig into this part of the code. The line is guess colon 32, which is a type. If you were with us when we did TypeScript, you know that we do colon and we declare the type. It looks similar here. We're saying it's an unsigned 32-bit integer. Um, we create a variable named guess, but wait, doesn't the program already have a variable named guess? Ah. It does, but Rust allows us to shadow the previous value of guess with a new one. This feature is often used in situations in which you want to convert a value from one type to another type. Yo, shadowing is new, right? I haven't heard of this, never done this with JavaScript, didn't do this with Python. Elixir sure doesn't have this that I know of. 
coming across something new, but let's see what it's all about. Shadowing lets us reuse the guest variable name rather than forcing us to create two unique variables such as guest string and guest, for example. Chapter three covers shadowing more detail. So we'll get into more detail, but that is pretty neat. We do that a lot, right? How many times have you, if any of you have used JavaScript, right? And you're, let's say you're reading something from local storage or you're taking a JSON string and you then parse it. So you would call the first one JSON string or like maybe you'd say, let's say you're parsing a string that's like um, a list of usernames and you say, you know, username JSON string and the next one is usernames. Now you don't do that. You can reuse the same variable name. Samuel said in the chat, sounds like Python, but having to be explicit. Yeah, it, that is true. You could do it in Python, right? You can make reuse the name, but this is like saying explicitly that you're reusing it, which is kind of cool. So in chapter three, it looks like we'll get into more about shadowing. So I'm pretty excited to see that. It is cool. It's a seems so far to me like a minor convenience, but um, we'll see. I, I do like it. Uh, so it's like casting. I I don't know if it's like casting. I think the casting is happening when we're saying u32, and we're not casting like we're kind of just clearing the type. It seems like what it's doing is allowing us to reuse reuse the variable name um, and modify the type. We actually do have to modify it. So we're not just saying it's a type integer. We actually have to do some sort of modification that will change the type. So it feels like a mutation, but it's it's actually a copy with some inline um, modifications or type transformations. So yeah, it's interesting. I guess chapter three, we'll find out a little bit more, but pretty interesting. Uh, we bind guess to the expression guess trim parse. The guess in the expression refers to the original guess. That was a string. The trim method on a string instance will eliminate all white space. So we're right about that. Although U32 can contain only numeric characters, the user must press enter to satisfy read line. When the user presses enter, which that's true, a new line character is created. So yeah, so that's what I was saying. It adds a new line when you type. Uh, so what you end up getting is five slash n. The n represents the new line. We need to trim that out. So just trimming out white space, trimming out new line characters, pretty cool. Here's the part where we're actually converting it, right? The parse, parse method on a string parses a string into some kind of number. Because this method can parse a variety of number types, we need to tell Rust the exact number type we want by using let guess colon u32. So that's like the casting that's happening there. Isn't parse doing the casting? So that's a great question. I think what parse is doing, it said here is parse is, is converting it to a number, right? It's taking it and converting it to a number. But as it says here, parse can make it many different types of numbers. So by saying u32, we're saying we want parse to cast this to an unsigned 32-bit integer. We could probably also say i32, which would be a signed 32-bit integer, and then we can deal with negatives, right? Um, so additionally, the u32 annotation in this example program and the comparison with secret number means that Rust will infer that secret number should also be a u32. So now the comparison will, will be between the two values of the same type. So it seems complicated, but really it's it's not too bad. If we just defaulted to using i32, which it, it uses by default, we could be okay. But because our guessing game doesn't want to get into negatives, because we know that the number can only be one to a hundred, um, we're just going to use unsigned so that it has to be a positive integer, right? And u32 is a good default there. Uh, the call to parse could easily cause an error. For example, if the string contained an emoji, there would be no way to convert that into a number because it might fail. The parse method returns a result type. And again, we know result types have okay values and error values and the dot expect is going to allow us to handle that error value appropriately. Had we not included the dot expect, well, first of all, we would see that our code would actually complain to us and tell us, yo, what's good. You got to handle that type. Um, but having the expect will let us handle the error. If no error is present, expect will just pass along the value. So that's really, really great. So pretty cool there. And you can see here, um, it'll call expect if it crashes. If parse can successfully convert the string to a number, it will return the okay variant of result. And expect will return the number that we want from the okay value. Let's run the program now. All right, let's try it. I'm going to go ahead. Let me run this actually here so you can all see it. And then I don't have to move myself there. All right, so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go into programs, projects, clear this out here. Oh, what happened here? 
Let me just clear this out. And let's scroll down here. There we go. And let's go to guessing game. Oh, I don't know what happened here. Developer, GitHub repos, learn Rust live. We're going to go into projects. We're going to go into guessing game. We're going to run cargo run. And it says here, the secret number is 100. Please input your guess. I'm going to put two. It says too small. I'm going to go ahead and the secret number is 89. I'm going to guess 100. It's going to say too big. I'm going to go ahead and run it again. I'm going to guess 29. It's going to say you win. I'm also going to run it again though. Let me just clear this so you can all see. I'm going to run it one more time and I'm going to put in a string. And you can see it panicked and it says, please type a number. So that's our error. Pretty cool. All right. So let's jump back over here. Let's just close this out. So nice. Even though spaces were added before your guess. So, oh, in that case, they added some spaces. So here we can try that out as well and see that the trim works. So I'm going to put space, 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 three. And it, it still worked. Panicked. Yeah, right. Um, okay. So let's see what's going on. Um, run the program a few times, verify the different behavior. We did that. Great. Allowing multiple guesses with a loop. So it works. It's guessing, right? And it's panicking correctly and showing us the error. Um, but what's the point, right? It give, it's giving us the number and it doesn't let us keep trying. It's us too small and then it's like, you're done. You're done, right? So you'll never, you'll never get more than one guess. So we need a loop. Now this is, I think, where we're going to get into the interesting part uh, because, you know, we can't write programs without loops. We need some sort of mechanisms for this. We know in JavaScript, we have many ways. Python, we have a few ways. Um, every language has its own way of doing control flow or looping. And so let's see how this, how this looks. The loop keyword, phew, they're just going to call it loop like that? Wow. Wow, it's not going to be four int i less than greater than i. Just for loop? Let's just call loop? Wow. Very clear. I know what this does. You know what this does. Creates an infinite loop. We'll add, add that now to give users more chances to guessing the number. All right. Let's just throw in a loop. So let's go to where it says, please input your guess. So you can see here, it, it, it didn't get rid of the code. It's just commenting out so that it can all fit. We're still going to keep the code we have. We're just going to put the loop outside our please input your guess. So we got our loop. Save that. As you can see, we've moved everything inside a loop. So you can see that here. I'm just scroll there so you can see our loop, right? Um, so everything's inside a loop now. The loop keyword creates an infinite loop. Um, be sure to indent the lines inside the loop. We did that. And let's run the program again. Cargo run. Let me zoom in there for you a little bit. Can everyone see that? Clear that, go to the top, cargo run. Uh, building, please input your guess, 92. So let's try 43. Too small. All right, let's try 50. Too small. All right, let's try 95. Too big. All right, let's try 93. Two. We know what it is. We win. But look, it's still going. So the only way for me to exit is to type, hit enter, or type a string, or break it. Or hit that prototype nonsense here, yeah, right? Um, so what we need to make it stop. We need to break this infinite loop, right? We can't stay here forever. The user could always interrupt the program by using the keyboard shortcut control C. We interrupted it by just making an error happen, whatever. Um, if the user enters a non-number, it'll crash, right? That's what we did. But how do we get it to actually quit? Let's see. Typing quit actually quits the game. So any other non-number input, yeah, right? Cause, Cause it just breaks. Um, Quit after getting a correct guess. So let's see how to quit after getting the correct guess. Uh, let's program the game to quit. So it says here, you can put a break statement. So very similar to something we've seen, right? A lot of languages using this break statement. The break statement is great. <laughs> All right, so notice here, I just do wanna call out that uh, since we're no longer using a one line function here, we're gonna put curlies. 
Um, I don't know if it's going to call that out for us, but I just want to call that out because it's something we'll see in JavaScript, right? When you start breaking past one line, you wrap it in that curly block. That's a block. And then we'll put the break. And uh, let's run it. Let's run it. Let's see if we have a good guessing game. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get rid of the thing that tells me what the secret number is. I'm going to do it. I'm ready. I'm going to get rid of it. You ready? Now, I don't know. We're actually going to play this. We're actually going to play this amazing game live. If you, can't, if you came to Twitch to watch the live streaming of one of the greatest games ever, wrong place. But you're seeing some rust, so that's even better. Let's binary search it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try it. So, ready? In fact, I can let, if you all want to drive this, we can do it. Cargo run. Input a guess. Where are we going? We going 50? We going right in the middle? I'm doing it. 50. Too small. We're going, we going 75? Too big. Woo! Woo! All right, 50, 75. Where are we going with this? 60. What's halfway? Three? What is it? 25. Let's do it. Too small. All right. That's it. We're going 70. Too big. Oh, 60. Let's go seven. Let's go seven. Too small. 68. Woo! 68, which is the number of viewers we have right now. 68, yeah, very close, very close. Yo, let's keep it clean in the chat. No, I'm just kidding. Great, yeah, we did good. 68, we guessed it, awesome. So our thing works, and look, the important part, right? It broke and it quit and we won. Awesome, so this is great. And we're just at 11 o'clock, which is where we're gonna be stopping for today, but let's just finish this last part because there's not too much more to it. We're gonna handle that failure case. Um, so we have it quitting after the correct thing. Now we want to handle invalid input. Uh, to further refine the game's behavior rather than crashing the program when the user inputs a non-number, let's make the game ignore a non-number so the user can continue guessing. That's a cool idea. We can do that by altering the line where the guess is converted from a string to U32. Okay, so it looks like they actually have this here. Instead of just calling expect, we're actually going to put a match condition 16 hour stream, yeah, let's go. So instead of calling um, expect on this, we're actually gonna do a match on the result. I really like this, this is pretty sweet. It's like uh, almost like in Elixir or a pattern matching language like, like Elm where we can actually match on stuff. So I really like this. So let's say okay, um, and it's gonna give us a number if it's okay, I like that. And we'll just return the number. Otherwise, if it's an error, it's gonna give us that error value. We don't care what it is. We're just gonna continue the loop. So pretty cool. Um, let me see what it's complaining about here. 32. Oh, we have to put it. Oh, see, look at this. Look at this in the front match. Wow. Okay, this is awesome. So instead of just using dot expect, we know that parse can potentially return a result value. So we are actually matching on this entire thing here, which is of type result. The two things that result can yield is it can yield an okay and give us that value, or it can yield an error and give us that error value. We don't care about the error value. We could we could type something here and then continue. Why don't we try that? Let's. I know we're going off script a little bit. Yes, exactly. I'm gonna make it display a message. We're gonna go off script a little bit but I like that idea better. So it kind of indicates what we're gonna do. So we're gonna say print, please input a number. Cool. No, we'll just say please input a number. And then we'll continue. All right, let's see if that works. So we're gonna go back to our thing here, clear it out. Clear, cargo run. I'm gonna guess 50, too big. I'm gonna guess, let's guess uh, Archangel. Please input a number. Okay, let's try part-time lover in the chat there. 
Oh, so there we go. We got our error message and then it says, please input your guess. So we can, we can continue going now. Too small. We saw that 50 was too big. We're gonna go 35. Whoa, look at that binary search. That's why binary search is awesome. Look, we nailed it. Look at that. Three guesses, come on, come on. We pros? Damn, we're gonna be going live streaming on this. We have to make a we have to make a number guess battle royale. Wow, we got the strats. All right, so there we go. We handled the error input. Let's we can read what let's read what they said. We, I think I kind of covered it. I think we figured it out. We're matching on this and handling both cases, but let's just read. Parse. Switching from an expect call to a match expression is how you generally move from crashing on an error to handling the error. Parse returns a result, and so it can be of type OK or error, and we matched on that. If parse is able to successfully turn the string into a number, it will return OK. If it fails, it will return error. So very cool. Um, and we're just handling that match statement, just like we did down here. Now everything in the program should work as expected. And it did. We did it. We got the guess in like three tries with binary search, right? Come on. Um, that worked well for testing, but it ruins the game. Let's delete the println. We already did that. We deleted the println. We, yo, <laughs> come on. Wait, amateurs, we did that a while ago. And that's it for chapter two. So let's read the summary. At this point, you successfully built the guessing game. Congratulations. We did it, chat. We did it. We built a guessing game. Two hours in, we've already built our first Rust program. That's pretty fun, I think. It was a hands-on way to introduce you to many new Rust concepts, let, match, methods, associated functions, the use of external crates. We did, we did do a lot. May have felt like a small program, we did a lot, right? We used Cargo. We went from using Rust C to compiling ourselves to using Cargo. We pulled in a crate. Um, we saw mutable variables, immutable variables. We had great questions in the chat asking about why we're doing an import one way versus another. We, we figured out, okay, we're doing some conversion to integers. Now let's build, who's that Pokemon? Yeah, we should, right? We have the emojis for it. So we did some cool stuff. Um, chapter three is gonna cover a concept that most programming languages have. So that'll be good. That'll be familiar to us. If anyone's familiar with programming, I'll probably, you'll, you'll hear me. I've been doing it all day, right? I'll compare stuff to JavaScript or Python, um, but it's a good way to ground what we're learning and something we already know. And if you're not familiar with an existing programming language, if this is your first programming language, well, ask in the chat, ask questions, we're here to help, and we'll try to make it sound like something familiar to you. So chapter three is gonna explore things like variables, data types, and functions, and shows how to use them in Rust. Chapter four explores ownership, a feature that makes Rust different from other languages. I'm excited for that. And chapter five discusses structs and method syntax. Chapter six explains how enums work. So these next few chapters will be less code heavy. They'll explain things, but what we'll do is to kind of make make it fun we'll pull up the terminal right and we'll try out some of the things we'll create variables we'll create stuff we'll mess around with it look at this in the chat oh my gosh python outdated java overrated long have we waited rust is created let's go i love it um so yeah that'll be it for tonight i just want to also give a shout out uh, again, to the authors, we have Steve Klobnik and Carol Nichols with anyone who contributed to the Rust community. We couldn't be here learning Rust without this fine book. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Again, I will post uh, the link to the book again in the chat here for anyone interested who hasn't followed along. I will commit this code. I'll put it up on GitHub. It'll be under the repo Learn Rust Live, the same name that we put inside our uh, project there, the same place we created. I will be posting this video on YouTube. So if you weren't able to follow along or you joined us late, no worries, put it in YouTube, watch it on 1.7 speed. You can handle it. You know, whatever you want, speed through it, jump around, go over it again. I encourage anyone to follow along. Again, the book is free. Hop in, check it out. We will continue next week. Again, Tuesdays from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be going through the book. Next week, we'll try to get through a few more chapters, chapter three and four, maybe five. Um, we'll code as we go. And I hope you all enjoyed learning Rust with me. If you wanna jump ahead and continue going, go ahead, but we'll be picking up right where we left off next Tuesday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Thank you everybody for hanging out in the chat. I appreciate it. Thanks for everyone who followed today. Uh, we had Saigon-esque, Samuel M, MD, Robatudo, Pepo Vola, Part-time lover last week. Let's go, appreciate it. Check it out on YouTube. Tom McGraw, I'll have this video posted along with the previous sessions. 
Thank you, everybody, and have a good night.